Welcome to class number four in the series Securing the Blessings of Liberty, an Examination of the United States Constitution. In this lesson, we're going to look at the remainder of the amendments to the Constitution, especially focusing on some of those that, that have really made important changes, even to the very structure of our government. We're also going to look at some of the solutions for restoring constitutional government. And we have a great opportunity now at this time in history to see a return to the, the original principles of liberty that formed and shaped the United States Constitution. All right, well, welcome to, this will be the last class in the series uh, of, of our look at the United States Constitution. We've um, come through the text of the original Constitution and also the Bill of Rights. And this time we're going we're gonna to continue to look at the later amendments to the Constitution. Does anybody know how many amendments total there have been to the, to the uh, U.S. Constitution? How many total? What do you think? Any guesses? 26. Close. 27. 27. Um, the most recent of which was in 1992. A lot of people don't realize the Constitution was amended in 92. We'll talk about that amendment. Kind of an interesting thing, but, but uh, 27 amendments to the Constitution. We've already looked at the first 10, the Bill of Rights, and now we'll be looking at the, the rest of them. We aren't going to hit every single one. Uh, you know, some of them are fairly procedural in nature, and, but we are going to look at uh, the, they're all important. I don't want to say the important ones, because they're all important, but uh, maybe some of the more interesting ones. Maybe that's a good way to put it. And I want you to notice as we as we go through, a, there's, a, there's a progression that takes place. So the Ten Amendments that we've looked at so far were all put in place to restrict government power. And what you're going to see as we go through these amendments, especially after we get through the, the, the first few that we're going to look at today, um, you will see that the later amendments tend to expand government power. So we're going to begin with the 12th Amendment. Um, again, we're going we're gonna to skip a few of these here just in the interest of time. But the 12th Amendment, if you have your, your pocket constitution, you can read the actual text of it. This is kind of a, a long amendment as far as constitutional amendments go. But you remember when we were talking about the, the election of the president and the electoral college system, uh, we talked about the, the election of 1800, and the election of 1800 was a very contentious election, possibly the most contentious election we've had in our history, and it, it wound up being the, the way that the system worked at that time was a little bit different than today, but uh, it wound up being between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, and if you remember, that had to go to 35 ballots in the House of Representatives before they finally elected Thomas Jefferson as the president. And the, the reason that that occurred that way was because at that time, the electors voted for president, okay? And whoever, essentially whoever was the runner-up became the vice president, all right? And, and that's the way it worked. Now what the 12th Amendment did as a response to that 1800 election, it uh, provided for a separate vote for president and vice president. And when you couple that with the, the changes that many states have made in how they do their electoral system, that's why you have the, the system today where you vote for a ticket. You vote for uh, a president and vice president in the popular vote, and that's the way it works in the electoral college then as well. And uh, that's because of the 12th Amendment. And, and so some of these early amendments, by the way, they were put in place to, to fix errors that, that you know, quickly became apparent in the Constitution, things that, that weren't going to work very well. Uh, understand a lot of things in the Constitution were fairly experimental, and they weren't sure how well they were going to work in the procedure and, and all of that. And so, uh, so they saw some things that needed to be fixed. And that was one of those things. Now, um, in, in these early years, up, you know, up, until, up until the Civil War, 
some of the most interesting things having to do with the Constitution are not the amendments that were passed, but the ones that didn't pass or that are, are treated as if they didn't pass. Um, this, this text here, uh, I refer to as the original 13th Amendment, and I'll tell you why you probably don't have it in your pocket Constitution. It's not printed as a part of the Constitution today, but the, uh, this, this amendment that was proposed said, if any citizen of the United States shall accept, claim, receive, or retain any title of nobility or honor or shall without the consent of Congress accept and retain any present pension, office, or emolument of any kind, whatever, from any emperor, king, prince, or foreign power, such person shall cease to be a citizen of the United States and shall be incapable of holding any office of trust or profit under them or either of them. Now that may sound familiar to you. Uh, there's, there's a provision earlier in the Constitution that we talked about that specifies that uh, somebody who holds an office under the United States cannot receive such a, a gift uh, without the consent of Congress. This was a strengthening of that position. And so what this says is not, not if any officer of the United States, if any citizen of the United States, even just a private citizen, if they receive any title of nobility, there's no provision for them to receive any title of nobility, they, they could receive these other things, present pension, office, emolument, if they get the permission of Congress. But if they either receive a title of nobility or they receive one of these other things without the permission of Congress, uh, they would lose not just the ability to hold office, but lose their citizenship. That's a pretty strong provision. Now we talked about some things about how even, even the Nobel Prize could be considered a, a, a present or an emolument of a foreign power. Um, certainly the, the practice of Great Britain, for instance, in honoring people by making them a knight of the British Empire, uh, as they did with, with uh, Senator Edward Kennedy. Uh, these kinds of things would be, would be highly regulated uh, under this provision. Now this, this was proposed and very quickly it was ratified by 12 states. Now it needed 13 states at the time to be ratified to become a part of the Constitution. And it, was, it required 13 states for ratification. By the end of 1812, 12 states had ratified it. From there, it's a little bit questionable. For instance, the state of Connecticut, there's no record in their official proceedings that Connecticut ratified this amendment. However, their legislature in, in printing what the laws of Connecticut were would include the Constitution, and at least three times they printed the Constitution with this amendment included as the 13th Amendment. Um, Virginia did ratify this March 12, 1819. It, it was included in a block of legislation that they voted on all at once. It, it wasn't a, you know, a separate a ratification bill or anything like that. But so, so either way, if Connecticut indeed did ratify it and they're just the record was lost or something, but even if not, uh, Virginia ratified it, um, this should have become a part of the Constitution. And in fact, from the 1820s to the 1860s, over and over again in almost all of the states, uh, it was printed as the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. About the, the late 1860s, I think the la maybe the last place that it appeared in a, a state printing of the Constitution was about 1876, but you get to about that Civil War period and it disappeared. And um, so that's why it's called the original 13th Amendment. In a printing of the Constitution today, it does not include it. Now, again, whether, whether uh, mistakes were made in the ratification and it truly wasn't ratified or whether it was people thought it had been ratified for about 40 to 50 years uh, where it was regularly printed as a part of the Constitution. So uh, just a you know interesting thing we're gonna see some other some other uh, um, errors and different things with ratification of some other amendments as well. A lot of these things are not as clear-cut as you would hope they would be or, or is what you think they might be. 
So that's the original 13th Amendment. Another interesting proposed amendment in that, that early period is referred to as the Corwin Amendment. And now we're, we're moving forward to just before the Civil War. Uh, Mr. Corwin, a, a uh, legislator from Ohio, he proposed this amendment in 1861. It was a last-ditch effort to avoid war. And what the amendment would have done is it, it prohibited the abolition of slavery by Congress. Okay? Now, I know today when you study the Civil War, you learn that the Civil War was only about slavery. And it's true, slavery was an issue. But understand, the lines are nowhere near as clear-cut as people would have you to believe. In fact, this amendment was passed by both houses of Congress, and it was sent out to the states for ratification. Now, the president really doesn't play a part in ratification, but generally, a, a, a president will send out an amendment like this that has passed Congress and will, will sign his name to it. President Lincoln sent this out to the states, gave it his endorsement, he signed it, and, and said that he supported this Corwin Amendment. So when you think of Abraham Lincoln as, as you know, somebody who wanted to come in and free the slaves, he was willing to give his support to a constitutional amendment that would have entrenched slavery. Okay? Again, these, these lines are not as clear-cut as sometimes, sometimes we make it in our history books. But uh, so this was never ratified. It never even came close to ratification. But um, it, it does show some interesting things about some of the true issues of the day. If you're wondering what some of the main issues were in the Civil War, certainly slavery was an issue. But slavery and the way people were reacting to that issue of slavery was more of a, of a symptom of some other things that were taking place and some, some uh, regional divisions that had taken place in the country. You know, going back to the Constitutional Convention, you always had this conflict between the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians, okay? The, the Jeffersonians, Jefferson very much believed that the future of the country was going to be in agriculture. Um, he, he believed in uh, a, you know, a strong financial basis, not, not operating on debt and, and those kinds of things. Hamilton, however, Hamilton was, he believed the future of the country was going to be in finance, in big business and in big government. You remember we looked at the, the plan that Hamilton had submitted for the new government, which was a complete consolidation of the states. It was essentially an elected monarchy. That's, that's about as big government as you can get. And, and Jefferson, of course, was very much small government. Jefferson emphasized the rights of the individual. And Jefferson's philosophy took root more in the South. Hamilton's philosophy took root more in the North. And at the time, uh, there were a, a lot of the, the government at the time, uh, the, the new Republican Party that Lincoln was a part of, was very much for big government. They were for big subsidies for corporations. And by the way, a lot of corporate law was put in place at that time leading up to the Civil War. Uh, you remember there recently was this Supreme Court decision having to do with corporations doing political spending, buying ads, and that kind of thing. And in the, in the news, they kept saying this overturned laws that went back to the 1860s, right, back to the Civil War. That's because a lot of corporate law was established at that time. And see, the South was kind of, kind of rebelling against that. You know that one of the major issues why the North felt they could not let the South secede, when the South seceded, they basically had free trade, or at least they had, they had lower tariffs than what the North did. And there was no way, if there were products coming in, for instance, through, through New Orleans or through Charleston, um, there was no way to, to put a tariff on those products as they moved north from, from the Confederate States into the United States. And the north wasn't going to get rid of the tariffs that they had in their ports. And so there were a lot of economic issues involved as well. And the, the Civil War, much more than just a war about slavery, it became about slavery, but, but really many of the tensions were about these differences of, of economic philosophy. Um, the, the result of the Civil War was that the Hamiltonian view won out. They won out not by proving the soundness of their ideas, they won out by military force. They won out 
by sending armies into the South, decimating the South. I mean, I mean, you can't imagine the degree of destruction that took place in the South, not just of, you know, of military targets, but of, of civilian targets. Uh, in fact, many of the, the uh, war criminals of the Nazi era, they pointed to the tactics of the Northern generals saying, you know, we weren't the first ones to, to do these things. Okay. There were several amendments to the Constitution that came from the aftermath of the Civil War. Sometimes they're referred to as the Reconstruction Amendments. And they are the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. The 13th Amendment was ratified in 1865, and it says, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. And Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Understand the Emancipation Proclamation um, did not free any slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation was a wartime measure that, that you know, guaranteed freedom to the slaves in the rebellious areas, in the seceded states, in hopes of sparking a slave rebellion. They, they hoped that as the slaves found out about the Emancipation Proclamation, that they would rebel against their masters and this would undercut the, the power of the South and bring an end to the war. It, it, it didn't work very well. Uh, there, were, you know, there were a few places where you had that, but it did not work on a, a large scale. Understand that not all of the slave states seceded. There were slave states that remained a part of the Union, and the Emancipation Proclamation did not free those slaves. So, again, these lines that, that are drawn in the history books are not as clear-cut as you might think. The, the slaves in the Union states, in the states that did not secede, were not freed until 1865 with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. And, and understand, it, it's always, a, it's always a, just an interesting thing to me how when you compare the, the leading generals in the South and the, and the shining stars there in the South were General Robert E. Lee and Thomas Stonewall Jackson. And both of those men were very much against slavery. They opposed slavery. Um, they, you know, they, they both were opposed to it. In the North, the, the leading general, or the man who came to be the leading general, was Ulysses S. Grant. Now, Ulysses S. Grant owned at least one slave. Uh, his, his wife had a slave that she brought to the marriage, and that was his slave. And his slave was not freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. His slave was freed by the 13th Amendment. And now uh, there was a point where he was asked why he didn't, why he didn't free that slave earlier than that, and he said that good help is hard to find. In fact, General Grant said that if he believed that the war was about ending slavery, that he would resign his commission and offer his sword to the other side. Okay, so Grant certainly didn't believe the war was about slavery. Um, again, he, Grant was in favor of slavery and he would have fought to preserve slavery according to his own words. Um, it, it wasn't primarily about slavery. Now notice what the 13th Amendment does. Uh, it says that slavery or involuntary servitude um, is not going to exist within the United States except as punishment for crime. This would be, you know, some states they have these chain gangs and, and things where you can be sentenced to hard labor. That's, it's, that's very rarely used today in most states. But that is allowable under the 13th Amendment. That would still be involuntary servitude, right? But it does allow it as punishment for a crime. Now, there's also something else that's new in the 13th Amendment as far as the, the progression of the Constitution in that it includes this, this section at the end that says Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Uh, be, before this, most of the amendments were about limiting the federal government and so you didn't need a, an enforcement clause. You don't need an enforcement clause to say that the government can't violate your right to free speech, right? But, but now this was an expansion of federal power before this slavery had been purely a state issue and as an expansion of federal power it has an enforcement 
clause. Now these enforcement clauses uh, often can be very broadly interpreted, right? So what's the ex extent of the enforcement power of the federal government with regard to this issue? It doesn't really put any, any limitation on that. This is another progression you'll see in these amendments is that they become more and more broad in their scope and, and uh, they give a great deal of leeway as far as interpretation goes. Now, then we come to the 14th Amendment. Now, this was ratified in 1868. The 14th Amendment is one of the longest amendments to the Constitution, and that's because it does a lot of things. And you can read the full text of it. One thing it does, it says it ensures equal protection of the laws to all citizens of the states. It, it does away with that three-fifths compromise. Remember, we, we talked about how for purposes of taxation and representation, uh, the, the slaves were counted as three-fifths, and that was to partially take some representative power away from the South. Um, it also gave the, the South a little bit of advantage when it came to taxation, but that was the compromise they reached. This does away with that. Um, it, it, it probably isn't even necessary because if you go and read who the three-fifths were in that, in that section of the original Constitution, by doing away with slavery, it, it really, really there wouldn't have been very many people that still would have been counted as three-fifths anyway. Uh, it does not, the 14th Amendment did not give the freed slaves the right to vote. Uh, some states, had, you know, voting rights at this time were still very much a state issue. The federal government had not defined who could vote and who couldn't vote. And each state decided, now some states wanted to not, you know, certainly the slaves didn't have the right to vote, but then when they were freed, they wanted to not give them the right to vote either. What the 14th Amendment does not guarantee the right to vote, but what it does is if a state is going to deny certain people the right to vote, it reduces their representation, okay? So, so and, it, and it goes by a proportion. Like if they're going to, if a state, some of these southern states had 40% slaves, all right? Now, if they were going to deny to the freed slaves the right to vote, they would figure up how many males over the age of 21 that were being denied their right to vote, and they would figure out what proportion that was of all the males over age 21, and then they would lessen their representation by that amount. So you might have a, a state that really by population would be entitled to say five or ten, maybe they're entitled to ten representatives. If they deny the right to vote to these freed slaves, they might lose four out of those ten representatives. Okay, so it, it, it doesn't guarantee that right to vote, but it does punish them if they deny somebody's right to vote. Another thing the 14th Amendment did, and this was a again, a very destructive thing for the South. Anyone who had held any office, whether, I mean, this, this would be, you know, local offices are considered a part, really a part of the state. Uh, the relationship between a state and a county, for instance, is not the same as the relationship between a state and, and the federal government. The county government really is a part of the state government. Um, anyone who held any office under the Confederacy if they, had, you know, if they had previously taken an oath to the Constitution, like all office holders have to do, and then they were a part of the Confederacy, it meant they could never hold future office. Now what that means is that all of the people that had any experience in government whatsoever now cannot hold office. And you've heard about the carpetbaggers who, who came down into the South. The reason they were able to come in and snatch up these offices was because if you, had, if, you had been, if you had been dog catcher under the Confederacy, you can't hold any government office. And so you take all the people that have any experience in government whatsoever and make them ineligible. Now, they could, uh, it also makes provision that somebody could get, get that ability reinstated by Congress. Okay? And I think, uh, for instance, Robert E. Lee's ability to hold office, I believe, was reinstated posthumously about 1970s, maybe. Uh, they did that, or 1980s, okay? You know, symbolic thing. <laughs> but uh, um, they did have the ability to get, get that back. Uh, it also repudiated all the Confederate debt. You know, the Confederacy had borrowed 
borrowed money from, they were always trying to get France to, to help them, and they had borrowed some money. It said, the United States is not going to cover any of that debt. Now, there, those, those were, you know, that's the wording of the, of the uh, amendment and the, the purposes of it. But there are some things that the 14th Amendment has done, some of which are intentional and some of which maybe were unintentional. One thing it does is it establishes federal citizenship. You know, before the 14th Amendment, there is no mention in the Constitution of anyone being a citizen of the United States. You were a citizen of your state, okay? What, what the 14th Amendment does, it says you're, you're a citizen both of the state that you reside in and of the United States. Now, understand the word citizen, I mean, technically you're a citizen of a lot of things. You're a citizen of your county, you're a citizen of your, your township or municipality, you're a citizen of, of your state. But again, for, for federal government purposes, this established federal citizenship. There was no, no such thing before that. Uh, and the effect of that is, is it gives the government greater power to regulate the people directly and to, to legislate the people directly. It's also the 14th Amendment that establishes birthright citizenship. You've heard about how uh, illegal immigrants will come into this country and they'll have a baby. And the baby, because they're born in the, inside the United States, is a citizen. Okay, well where does that come from? It comes from the 14th Amendment. Now, now some people would argue that that interpretation isn't really valid, that, that you could interpret this and not necessarily allow, they, they call these anchor babies, because once that, that uh, illegal family, once they have a baby that's a citizen or a child that's a citizen, they're almost guaranteed that they will never be deported and, and probably that they will be given citizenship as well. Uh, and, and so if you can have a child in the country, then that, that child becomes the anchor that allows you to pull all the rest of your family into the country as well. But uh, that comes from the 14th Amendment. It, you know, the, the, really the major issue in the Civil War was to what degree the states had rights as states. And by setting up a new federal citizenship, certain, certain states' rights certainly are, are maintained but now the, the individual's connection is not so much to their state, but it's to the, the nation as a whole. These things are steps. Remember, the, the founders debated about whether they should set up a national government or a federal government. A federal government would be a, a federation of these independent states, or should they set up a national government like Hamilton wanted? And they decided on a federal government. These things are steps toward a national government government because now you have a national citizenship, a federal citizenship. Nobody today talks about being a citizen of the state of Wisconsin. They talk about being a citizen of the United States, right? And that begins there. Yes, ma'am. What do you suppose was meant by the um, requirement that a president be a natural born citizen then? The, and, and we talked about that uh, in, a, in a previous lesson. Um, it's natural born citizen is kind of a, a tricky term with regard to its definition. There, historically, there have been different standards for what constitutes a natural born citizen. Um, the, the standard that was laid out by Emmerich Vattel in the Laws of Nations was somebody who was born in the country to parents who were both citizens. That was one standard. Blackstone's standard, Blackstone's standard more had to do with somebody being born just in the borders of the country. The Supreme Court has never clearly ruled what a natural born citizen for constitutional purposes means. Um, you know, there's some statutes and things that deal with it, but, but a statute doesn't necessarily use the same definition as the Constitution would. But natural born citizenship is a higher standard than just citizenship. Um, you know, somebody can, can gain citizenship through naturalization. They would not be a natural born citizen. So they had some idea of nation versus state when that was written. It, that still would have, would have had to do with being, it, it doesn't say a natural born citizen of the United States. The, the implication would be that they were a natural born citizen of one of the states, right? 
Um, the 14th Amendment has been used to justify vast new powers for the federal government, especially under the, the provision that uh, the, the equal protection of the laws and also the privileges and immunities that are mentioned in that amendment. Okay? Uh, the equal protection of the laws, this was what was used in uh, Brown v. Board of Education where the Supreme Court ruled that you couldn't have segregated schools. They said that was not equal protection of the laws. Um, and so there, so there you have, again, the federal government having the, bil the ability to go in and overturn state laws under this amendment. Uh, it, it also mentions the, the privileges and immunities there. And, and let me say that there are a, I'll come back to this one, there are some myths about the 14th Amendment. There are some people who believe that every problem in our country can be tied back to the 14th Amendment. All right? Now, any time somebody is going to try and present to you some silver bullet, uh, so, you know, something that they just believe is the key to everything, it, it's never the case. Right? I mean, problems don't come from one single source. They come from many, many sources. If they came from one single source, we could, we could get rid of a lot of problems easily. Uh, the 14th Amendment, for instance, it, it, while it does establish an additional federal citizenship, it does not do away with state citizenship. Okay, this is something some people say about the 14th Amendment. One thing they say is that the 14th Amendment replaces rights with privileges and immunities. The problem with that is privileges and immunities are mentioned earlier in the Constitution as well. All right, now rights are different from privileges and immunities. Uh, a right is something that is unalienable, going back to the Declaration. Uh, a right is something given by God. Privileges and immunities are things that are, are granted by a government. Okay? And this does not replace your rights with privileges and immunities. What it, what it does say is that, that these privileges and immunities have to be uniform. You can't, you can't have double standards. You can't treat blacks one way and whites one way. You can't, you know, that's, so, so it doesn't really do what some people claim it does. Uh, also, some people will point to the 14th Amendment with regard to what they call corporate personhood. Now, people use that term corporate personhood kind of loosely. Um, it, corporate personhood, you know, a corporation for legal status is considered a, a person. That's why you can sue a corporation and that kind of thing. Um, but, but often when people talk about this with the 14th Amendment, they're not talking about corporations being treated like people. They're talking about people being treated like corporations. Okay, and, and there are people that try and put a lot of emphasis on this and they'll tell you, you know, if you fill out certain government forms and things, you can go back to being a free person instead of a corporation and that kind of thing. Now, some people make a lot of money selling people these packages that'll teach you how to, how to do all these things. Now, there is some truth in some of it, but again, it's not, it's not the silver bullet that people think it is. And the reason for that is this, this kind of stuff, and, and this stuff where you can you know, fill out these forms and restore your sovereign personhood and that kind of thing, they assume that the government follows the rules anyway, and we know it doesn't, right? Well, you know, what, what do they follow? We've seen all these provisions of the Constitution that they don't follow. If they want to violate your rights, they don't have to sneak something in through, through an amendment to get you to give up your rights. or what, They'll just do it. Right? And, and if they want to violate your rights, it doesn't matter what paperwork you've filled out or, or what, what initials you put after your name or you know, if you understand all, all these things about contracts and, and different things, if they, you could do everything right and if they want to violate your rights, they're just going to do it. Right? So, so be careful about those things. Now again, I'm not saying there's no truth in it at all, but I'm saying people put far too much emphasis on it and, um, and you've got to be careful of that. Now, the 14th Amendment, there's a lot of questions about whether it was legally ratified. You know that after the Civil War, states, uh, there were conditions put on them being re-entered into the Union and to them having representation in Congress. Um, this, this was really very much a double standard because, of course, the North's position all through the war was that states could not secede, but then after the war was over, 
they treated them as if they had seceded and needed to be re, re uh, uh, entered into the Union. If they didn't secede, then they're still a part of the Union, right? So they used this double standard. Now, the 13th Amendment, there, were, there weren't a lot of problems with ratification. And some of the states, you know, there's a question of because some of these states had, had re-entered and some had not yet, uh, how many states do you need for ratification? The 13th Amendment, they counted many of these southern states that when it came to the 14th Amendment, they treated them as if they weren't states anymore. Okay, so just some, some strange irregularities. Um, the, the, the president, at the time, this is after the assassination of Lincoln, so this is Andrew Johnson, he did not sign this amendment. He didn't support it. And if you're familiar with Andrew Johnson at all, you know that, that Andrew Johnson wanted to take a much, a much more lenient approach toward the southern states than what the rest of the Republican Party wanted, and that's why he was impeached. Now, they came up with some, some reason to do it, but the fact was they didn't like how lenient he was going to be with the South, and they tried to get rid of him, and, and he almost was impeached. It came, you know, one, came down to one vote. I mean, he was impeached, I should say. He was impeached. He wasn't removed. Um, Johnson did not, did not support this amendment. In addition to that, the, you know, the, these states had their state legislatures all through the Civil War, but the Reconstruction Acts didn't recognize the existing state legislatures. They set up rump legislatures, and the rump legislatures were little more than just, just puppets of the federal government. And so when it came to ratification, it wasn't the legislature that, that the people of the state had elected. It was often these rump legislatures that approved ratification. And so uh, the, the uh, 14th Amendment, if it was ratified at all, was ratified under duress. In fact, in at least one case, uh, state legislators were held captive by, by Union troops until they changed their vote in order to approve ratification. All right, that's not the way it's supposed to work. But um, that's how they got the 14th Amendment through. The other Reconstruction Amendment is the 15th Amendment. And this does establish the right to vote uh, it says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So you can't deny somebody the right to vote because they're black or because they're African or because they were previously a slave. Um, notice it doesn't say anything about sex. Women's suffrage had not been passed yet. Uh, it doesn't say anything about age. At this point, these you know up to up to uh, this amendment, who could vote was completely determined by the state. And here now you have you have the federal government coming in and saying this is who you have to allow vote. And again, you see that enforcement clause at the end of the the amendment. This led the way then to further amendments that would say that you cannot deny the right to vote on the basis of sex, that you cannot deny the right to vote to anyone over age 18 on the basis of age. Okay, this, this opened the door. Okay, and so those are, those are the Reconstruction Amendments. So they're, they're passed in that period right after the Civil War, and all of them expand federal government power from what, what it had been before. Then you don't have any amendments to the Constitution until you get into the 1900s. And that's where we're going to go next into the, the uh, 1900s. By the way, you'll notice with amendments to the Constitution is that they, they tend to be sort of clustered together. Okay? You have the first ten amendments that are, are passed very early on. Uh, you have a few, you know, a few amendments in there up to the Civil War, and then you've got those three Reconstruction Amendments in just a very short period of time. You don't have any, any uh, major amendments for a while, but you get to 1913, and now we have the 16th Amendment. The 16th Amendment gives Congress the power to tax income. Uh, tax day was not too long ago. Uh, before the 16th Amendment, that tax that, that you paid on tax day uh, would not have been constitutional. The, the taxing provision under the Constitution was that taxes had to be apportioned to the states by population. And 
generally the states would collect that tax. That was for direct taxes. Uh, the federal government could certainly set tariffs and, and some of those things. But direct taxes had to be by apportionment. The 16th Amendment allows there to be a tax on income. It says from whatever source derived. Now, what, what the definition of income is has always been a contentious issue. Okay, if, if I go out and buy uh, some stock, for instance, right, I buy it at a, at a certain price and then I sell it at a higher price, my, you would say my income is the difference between the two, right? Well, when it comes to labor and you're going to trade labor for some price that you've contracted, what's your income on it? You're really trading something of value for something of value. You're not, you're not making any income on it. And so there's a discussion about whether wages really truly should be considered income and even whether legally they are, they are considered income. But the 16th Amendment is what gives them the power to tax income. It says without apportionment and without regard to any census or enumeration. The 16th Amendment uh, is the, the subject of a book by a man named Bill Benson called The Law That Never Was. And the 16th Amendment, of all of the amendments, I mean, we've seen some where there's some, some disputes about, about uh, ratification, okay? The 16th Amendment and the way they got this ratified was so messy that even the Secretary of State had questions about whether it was properly ratified. There were some states which according to their records, said they voted not to ratify it, that the Secretary of State said they did ratify it. There were states that ratified, there was one state that changed the wording to basically say just the opposite, that Congress would not have the power, and that's what they, that's what they voted on in their legislature, and that's what they passed. Secretary of State said they ratified it, okay? And the, nearly every state there was some sort of error in the ratification process. Either they changed the wording. See, they have to vote on the exact wording. They can't change it. They can't change the word um, to lay to the word levy and have it, have it be valuable. Now, some of it was typographical problems, copying problems, capitalization, uh, punctuation. You know, there's, there's no real punctuation there in that statement that would, would change the meaning of it. Okay, and, and some of those problems were those kinds of things. But some of the states, there were serious, serious issues about whether they really ratified it. Um, there was one state where the, the governor of the state sent back that it had been ratified before the legislature had even voted on it. Now, if you think about what, what was going on around that time and why there might have been such a rush and such a push to get this through as quickly as possible, you may recognize the year 1913 as the year that the Federal Reserve was established, right? The, the year where a, essentially a, a private banking cartel was set up, controlled by these big banks in New York and you know, in the, in the uh, Northeast. And this Federal Reserve was gonna have a lot of power over the monetary policy. Congress did not have a great deal of power to tax the people at the time. This is what allowed them then to have that greater power to tax that would be able to, to secure, if you would, the, the Federal Reserve System. Okay? And there was a big rush to get it through. And that's why the mistakes were made. Now, you can go read Bill, Bill Benson's material and he'll go through state by state and he has the actual certified documents where he's gone to these state capitals and, and gotten certified copies from their archives of the actual documents and you can see this was never properly ratified. The 16th Amendment was never properly ratified. And um, Bill Benson has been ordered by the Supreme Court not to tell anybody about this. They, did not, they didn't allow him to present any evidence as to whether it was true. They said even telling people that this is unconstitutional, that you're encouraging people to not pay their taxes. Okay, And uh, so he's under a, a court order right now not, not to tell anybody that the 16th Amendment is unconstitutional and that it was never properly ratified. Um, 
and, and was not allowed to even present any of the evidence that what he was saying was true. But uh, go, you want to read some interesting history, go read about the history of the 16th Amendment and how it was pushed through and how it was ratified. Can you get his book? Um, I, yeah, I, I believe you can still get his book. Uh, you can't get some of the, the more in-depth information that he was selling previously, but I believe you can still get the book. Um, also 1913, you have the 17th Amendment, which provides for the direct election of senators. Remember, previous to that, the state legislatures elected the Senate as someone to go and represent the state, not, not the people directly, but the state. And we've, we've seen in our diagram, okay, so originally you had this, this balance here with the House representing the people and the Senate representing the states. Uh, in, you know, by this time, by 1913, most of these electors were being selected by, by the people. But early on, um, as when the Constitution came, first came into effect, most of the electors for the president were selected by the states. And remember that Republican government, Republican government has a lot of these intermediate levels of government because the idea is that if you have all these intermediate levels that are, are fighting for power, it separates the power out and nobody gets too much. Okay, And there is, there is just as much power or just as much danger of putting too much power in the executive branch as there is of putting too much power with the people directly. Because de democracy, remember, the people have all the power, and democracies, as, as we saw, many of the founding fathers said, they commit suicide, they murder themselves. Because the people figure out that they have the power, they figure out they can use the government as their agent to oppress whatever minority they want. They can use the government to tax their neighbors and give it to them, right? And it winds up falling apart. Well, the 17th Amendment is a step away from republicanism and toward democracy. And then you, you couple that with the changes in the electoral system. Um, and, and you see we are moving very quickly toward a democratic system instead of a republican system. And just as evidence of that, uh, you may be aware that, that in this past session of our state legislature that, that just ended, there was a bill introduced that would have entered Wisconsin into an agreement that instead of distributing our electoral votes the way we do now, that we would give all of our electoral votes to whoever won the national popular election. Okay? And, and there's some states that have already entered into this. Well, that's that would remove the last vestiges of Republican government when it comes to the Electoral College and would make it essentially a, a purely Democratic vote for the executive branch. Okay? That, by the way, there, was, there were a couple of, it was mostly Democrats that signed on to that bill. There was a Republican that signed on to that bill, Al Ott, and Within about two days of the bill coming out, he had so many phone calls, he said he was going to remove his name. He said he didn't really understand what the bill did. Now, he was listed as a, a, a co-author, a co-sponsor of the bill. Either he had never read it, that's possible, or he used that as his excuse when he realized how unpopular it was. But uh, that, that shows you the kinds of things that happen in our state legislature. Okay, so uh, very quickly then we can go through some, some later amendments, and again, we're not hitting every one, but the 18th Amendment is what prohibited alcohol. Uh, it was ratified in 1919. Now, a new thing in this amendment was that it included an expiration, which said that if it's not ratified within a certain number of years, then it's, you know, it's off the table. Earlier amendments did not have that, which means amendments that were proposed without any kind of expiration, they're still sitting out there. A certain number of states have ratified them. If the states want to pick them up now and, and more states ratify them, they can do that. But uh, this one included an expiration, and many of the proposed amendments since then have included expirations as well. Uh, in the, the uh, 19th Amendment, ratified 1920, you have women's suffrage, says you can't deny the right to vote based on, on sex. 
Um, the 21st Amendment then was the repeal of prohibition in 1933. By the way, with these, with these voting changes, um, these also represent really a, a move away from, away from Republican type government toward Democratic government. The, you know, the issue in, in the founding generation, most states, you know, it was a state issue, but most states, it was, it was men that voted. It was generally heads of household that voted, and it, and it was considered, it wasn't, it wasn't so much to, to deny anyone the right to vote, but it was instead, they had the idea of instead of being one person, one vote, it was sort of like one household, one vote. You know, an adult male would be the head, head of the household, and he was voting for his entire household. We've moved away from that toward more of a system of one person, one vote, which is a more democratic thing. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily recognize that institution of the, the family or the household, and instead it's one person, one vote. But uh, you, you see that in these amendments that change the, uh, the requirements of who's eligible to vote. The 22nd Amendment was ratified in 1951. I believe it was proposed in 1946 or so. And if you remember, President Roosevelt actually was elected to four terms as president. Now, he didn't serve completely four terms. He, he uh, died in office. But he was elected to four terms. And the 22nd Amendment places term limits on the president. They place a limit of two terms. That had some, some traditional and historical significance. You remember George Washington, our first president, after his second term, he, he refused to run again. And uh, that shows a lot about Washington's character. Many of the people in the country would have been satisfied to make Washington king, but he stepped down after two terms. This set that as not just a tradition then, but as the law. A president can only serve for two terms. That's the 22nd Amendment. The 26th Amendment sets the voting age for the entire country at 18. Uh, previous to that, some places it was 21. States could determine their age. This now sets the, the uh, voting age at 18 years old. And the, the latest amendment to the Constitution was ratified in 1992. And this is an example of just what I was talking about because this amendment was one of the original Bill of Rights. Remember, the Bill of Rights contained 12 proposed amendments. Only 10 of them were ratified. The first two were not ratified. Um, the 27th Amendment was one of those that was not originally ratified. Somebody took up the cause in later years to get it passed, and enough states ratified it, and it became a part of the Constitution. So it was, it was proposed in 1789 and just sat there for 200 years and was ratified in 1992. What it does is it says that a congressional pay raise doesn't go into effect until there's been an election in the House of Representatives. So that if Congress decides to give themselves a raise and the people don't like it, you can vote them out of office. And um, proposed 1789, ratified 1992. And uh, so it, you know, most of the amendments that have ever been proposed to the Constitution have passed. Uh, there's, you know, even, even to get it to be a proposed amendment, it's got to go through Congress. So most of the time if it does that, it's probably going to pass. There's only a few that are still sitting out there that haven't passed. But any of those that haven't passed, uh, you, could, you could go and take up that cause and get some states to ratify it if it didn't have an expiration date and, and get it passed. That original 13th, 13th Amendment, if enough people decided they they wanted that back in the Constitution. You're probably not going to convince people just to put it back in that it was, that it was intentionally left out, but you could go out and get the states to ratify it and, and have, it, have it added back in there. And so that brings us to the, to the end of these amendments, and we are going to take a short break, but before we do that, does anyone have any questions? If a state ratifies an amendment and they unratify it, it's, it's unclear. And that was another thing I didn't mention with the 16th Amendment. Some of the states that did ratify it later came back, before it had been adopted, came back and said, we want to rescind our, <laughs> our ratification. 
and it's not clear if they can do that. Uh, it, it doesn't specify in the Constitution whether they can, they can undo that. That goes as well, by the way, for calling for a constitutional convention. And um, at various points, I think, I think we're at the point where something like 34 states have called for constitutional convention, a constitutional convention. Um, some of those states have later rescinded that call, but who, who's to say? I, you know, I, guess, I guess legally the Supreme Court would be the ones that would have to rule on that, but uh, the Constitution doesn't specify. And really the, the general rule is if it doesn't say that they have the power to do it, they probably don't. Uh, you know, if they've, if they've ratified it, that, you know, seems like that stands even if they later change their mind. But again, you know, some, somebody would have to rule on that. Yeah, it would seem a little um, anarchic to be able to rescind it. For example, if 30 states now decided to rescind their agreement to one of the amendments that's already in existence. Well, but, but, but you're not asking about after it's been adopted, right? You're, you're asking about yeah, right the, it's yeah, so. you know, the, the, ones, the ones that are adopted, once they're adopted, you can't undo that except by a, a separate amendment to repeal it. But, but the ones that are sitting out there, the ones that, that haven't been adopted, but some states have ratified them, you know, it's, it's unclear whether those states can rescind that ratification. And it's, you know, with a, with a, a constitutional convention, it's, it's even probably more of, a, of an issue because different states have called such a convention for different purposes. Now, the Constitution doesn't say that you can limit a convention to one issue, but states have called it, called it for various purposes, and, and it could be a dangerous thing because the purposes that they call it for may not be what the convention sticks to. You know? Especially given the passage of time between um, right. the actual convention right. being called and the initial request yep. for it. Yep. There, you know, there are certainly a few things that could have been made more clear that uh, it, would, it would help if they were clear. And, and it would probably be good to, you know, for there to be a movement to propose some clarifying amendments to the Constitution. You could clarify a lot of things. You could spell out what a natural born citizen is. You could, you could spell out some of these things that there are questions about and make it a part of the Constitution so that it's not left to some panel of judges somewhere. It's spelled out there in the document. And, and that could probably be a valuable thing. Although any amendment to the Constitution is fraught with danger. Because what your intent in putting it there, what your intent is may not be how it's used and how it's interpreted. And, and so it's something to be very careful about. Um, for instance, uh, there are, are Many people, many uh, uh, people, you know, on the religious right, that would like to see an amendment to the United States Constitution that would forbid same-sex marriage. Right? Now, let's think about that. Is that something that limits federal government power or expands federal government power? Do it expands it. It doesn't limit it. It expands it. Now you've opened the door to take marriage, which the federal government has never had anything to do with marriage, now you make, make marriage a federal issue. And I don't, you know, I, I don't trust my state legislators that much to make decisions about marriage, but I trust the federal legislature even less. You know? but, but then you've opened that door. See, now you've added another thing that the federal government can control. And, and you have to look at, again, not what the intent of something is, but you've got to look at how is it going to be used? What precedent does it set? What, what doors does it open? And the only, the only good constitutional amendments today would be ones that limit government, not ones that expand it. No matter whether, whether you think it would have a good intent, um, you, you know, what we need is, is limited government. We need to, if anything, we need to repeal some of those, some of those amendments that have been put in place that have expanded federal government Not power. Within suffrage, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take about a five-minute break.
We're going to move on this last section now. We want to talk about what are, what are the solutions. You know, we see, we see many of these problems, many places where the Constitution is violated. Um, what, are, what are the solutions? And I don't, I don't have a lot of slides. In fact, I'm just going to leave that one up there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for about half of the time that we have left, and then, and then whatever time we have left after that we'll just have uh, for, for discussion. But um, the, there, there's a couple things to understand about how power works. And that's when you're talking about these constitutional issues, you're talking about power, right? The, the Constitution is there to limit federal power. In some cases, it limits state power as well, but, but uh, largely, at least under the Constitution originally, most of the power was to be at the state level. Now, that's no guarantee that, that your state legislature is going to pass any better laws than what the federal government does, but the idea behind it is that the, the, the more local things are, the better. The better right? And there's a, there's a principle to understand about authority and power. There, there are a lot of things in society that have power, a lot of institutions. Government is only one, one institution that has authority and power. Um, you know, first of all, you have, you have individual autonomy. I mean, you have, you have the greatest degree of power over you because you decide the actions you're going to do on a, on a daily basis. Um, you also have things like the family. Uh, the family is a, a structure of authority and power. In fact, most people, their basic ideas about what proper authority is comes from how, how they were raised in their family atmosphere. Um, you, you also have private institutions. Uh, much of the work that's being done by the government today in, in time past was done by private institutions. And, and private institutions are voluntary institutions. You know, they don't have the, the power to force you to do something because you can always just leave the organization or whatever. But you have, you have those private institutions, churches, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. And then you have the government. And one of the errors that people often fall into is they see some problem in, in society and their me immediate reaction is to think, if we just had a law, right? If we could just get the government to, to deal with this. And you know, in most cases, government is the worst institution to deal with problems in society, all right? And the thing about these authorities is that, that anytime you're going to strengthen one authority, you have to weaken something else, okay? If you're going to strengthen the government, for instance, to, to make decisions about how families should raise children or what proper discipline is or, or whatever, you can't do that without weakening the family, right? If you strengthen one, you weaken the other. Now, even within, within the government where you have those different levels and branches of government, whenever you strengthen one, you have to weaken the other. There's, almost, there's only so much power to go around. And, you know, if, if the reason you need any kind of government at all, at all is because people misuse their individual authority over their own lives, and rather than just living, you know, living their life, they try and violate other people's rights, right? What, what did the Declaration say? It said we're endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, and it said that uh, governments are, are uh, created to protect those rights, okay? And, and so the reason we have government at all, and the reason we have these other organizations and, and things, are because, because People as individuals make bad choices. They seek to violate other people's rights. They seek to violate people's rights to property and to liberty and, and even to their lives. And so you have these other institutions that are there to, to restrain that, right? And the Founding Fathers recognized, you know, one of the major debates that was going on in the culture at large leading up to independence was whether the American people were really moral enough to be able to have independence. Because the founders understood that if people don't regulate themselves, if they don't exercise their individual authority to regulate themselves and to, to limit and restrain themselves, inevitably some, some other power is going to come into that vacuum 
and they're going to be regulated by something. If people don't regulate themselves, they're going to be regulated by, by government or by other individuals or whatever. And so this is an important thing to, to keep in mind when you think about these matters of, of power and authority. The, the greatest thing that a person can do to, to advance the purposes of the Constitution doesn't involve making phone calls to legislators and, and writing letters and drafting legislation and all of that. One of the greatest things that you can do is live as a free person. You know that rights are a lot harder to take away if everybody's out exercising their right. Um, the, when you think of the, the rights that are guaranteed in the Bill of Rights, most of them are fairly well protected. And one that is the least protected is the Second Amendment, right of the people to keep and bear arms. Well, why is that? It's because as we've, as we've moved away from a rural society to, uh, to a uh, more metropolitan society, um, people don't see the need to, to bear arms as much, although you, know, you might argue that in a, in a city is the place where it might be the most important to, to uh, bear arms. But um, I mean, if you go out and, and just randomly pick people off the street, you're going to find that there's a lot of people that don't own a weapon, don't have any interest, uh, even if they own a weapon, don't have any interest in bearing it, you know, in, in carrying a handgun in a holster or, or whatever. And so because people aren't exercising the right, it becomes much easier to take the right away. It's a lot harder today to, to infringe somebody's right to free speech than it is to infringe their right to keep and bear arms because more people are exercising their right to free speech. And so if you exercise your rights, it makes it harder to take them away. If everybody in the country was already walking around bearing a weapon, it would be impossible to take that away. Okay? When only a few people do that, it's easy to take away because they're a, they're a minority. And so living as a free person, it, it doesn't mean you always have to exercise your rights. right? I mean, you have a right to free speech. That doesn't mean you have to say everything that you think. But exercising those rights is what, what allows you to keep those rights in the long run. And so it's important as a, as a person to exercise your rights, but to limit and restrain those rights so that you don't give somebody an excuse to come and want to, want to take it away. All right? You don't want to give, give the people who, who like tyranny and the people who want to violate your rights, you don't want to give them the excuse to do it. Uh, you know, on the same account, if everybody who's out there exercising their right to keep and bear arms is shooting people or, or you know, misusing that right, that gives an impetus to take the right away or to not secure that right. I shouldn't even say take the right away because rights can't be taken away by government, but the government can choose to violate that right or choose not to secure that right. And so living as a free person is an important thing. Um, when you make decisions about what you're going to do in your life, don't, don't get so concerned about the government. Um, you know, just make, make decisions as a, a free person. Um, education is an important thing. That's what these classes are about. You've got to know what your rights are. You've got to know how the government is violating the contract so that, so that you can uh, do something about it. And so education is an important thing. And you can't depend on somebody else to educate you. You have to, you have to educate yourself. Um, in, in many cases, there, you know, we can talk about all these, all these uh, unconstitutional government programs. You know that those programs, they, they stand, they're, they're guaranteed to stand if nobody ever challenges them. And you know, just because the government says you have to participate in some, in some program, you see what the contract is, right? You can read the contract and you can see whether that thing is constitutional or not. And you got to choose your battles, but there's nothing wrong, there's nothing morally wrong with holding government to that contract and saying, no, you don't have the right to force me to participate in, in this program. Although often, often what people do, people are very one-sided in the ways that they want to, to challenge uh, unconstitutional government actions. Uh, for instance, there are many people that will refuse to pay income tax, but 
when they're eligible for Social Security, they don't have any problem going and, and signing up for that. And you know, Social Security, it, you know, we've seen how the income tax was questionably ratified. There's questions about whether it's valid. Social Security is clearly unconstitutional. Nothing in, nothing in the Constitution that would authorize the government to tax you to pay for other people's retirement, right? But, but why is it that people will uh, oppose the income tax and refuse the income tax, but they won't refuse Social Security? You know, if, if you're going to do that, you've got to be kind of consistent in it if you want that argument to have any, any power. I would say that somebody saying, I'm going to refuse to file for Social Security would have much more power as a, as a statement than to say, I'm going to refuse to, to uh, pay my income tax. Because refusing to pay the income tax, you gain a benefit from when you refuse to participate in Social Security and, and refuse to receive Social Security, you're actually giving up a benefit in order to hold the government to their contract. All right. So keep in mind those things and choose your battles. And, and it's a good thing to challenge government power. Live as a free person. Don't, don't let people take away or, or violate those rights. Now, you're always more effective if you can get a group of people to work together instead of just one person on their own. Uh, w one of the problems when it comes to defending the Constitution is the, you know, the, ki the kinds of people like you and I that will come to a class like this and they're concerned about what the Constitution says, we tend to be pretty individualistic. We don't mind going our own way and, and nobody else being with us, but in some cases that can hold us back because you got to work together with a group to, to get anything done. It's very easy for the government to violate the rights of one individual. It's much harder for them to violate the rights of a group. Right? You're talking about that community garden. Um, now again, whether, whether people's rights were violated or not, uh, if there was one person there, it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have meant as much as the fact that there was a group of people there. Right? And I, you know, when you try and when you try and organize and work as a group with with people that are that are individualists, it can be a hard thing to do, right? You know, and uh, you can wind up with a lot of debate and a lot of talk and not a lot of action. Okay, but uh, but but those are the kinds of things that have to happen. Now, certainly, uh, it's important to support legislative efforts to to rectify some of the problems. Okay, and that's where you got to have a group. You know, if you, if you write just some letter by yourself to a legislator on one issue and your letter is the only one they ever get from anybody, I can tell you what's going to happen to it. Uh, they don't even bother writing out a, a form letter response to it. It goes in the garbage can. But they get 10 letters on that topic and they'll at least think about the issue and write out a form letter to, to send out to people. And when they get 100 letters, again, it doesn't guarantee they're going to do what you want, but you see how, how the numbers game works. Okay? And, and so lobbying is, is an important thing. And you have to learn to play their game. A lot of times the things that people think are effective in lobbying for legislation are not the things that are, are really effective. And, and there's a lot of good training out there that you can get. You can get training through a lot of political parties now are providing training for, for grassroots people. Um, the, the Campaign for Liberty, and I, you know, it's, it's good to identify these different groups that you can work within. Campaign for Liberty, is I'm the, I'm the Wisconsin 6th District Coordinator for Campaign for Liberty. You, there's sign-up sheets there on the, on the uh, back table, and they provide a lot of tools. They provide some very good training for to, to let you know what actually works and what doesn't work and how how when you're starting to be effective what the politicians will do to try and buy you off or or you know neutralize what you're doing you got to know that stuff in advance that's that education again another thing is to you know, most people, when you talk about these issues, and of course we're talking about the federal constitution, so a lot of what we're talking about has to do with federal issues, but the, the, the broader issues of government and liberty, a lot of times people overlook the things that they can do locally. And of course, the issues that people get real worked up about and that you can get a big group of people worked up about tend to be the national issues because they're, they're bigger issues. Okay? But 
most of the valuable work can be done right on the local level. And, and people don't realize what happens in local government. For one thing, local government is the incubator for higher levels of government. I mean, you're not going to find a lot of people in the state legislature who haven't held some position in local government. And so if you get good local government, that helps you to get good state government and good, good national government as well. And you know that um, there's a lot of things locally that, that people overlook. You may not realize that the highest law enforcement official in, in the country, really, is the local sheriff. Uh, the county sheriff has a wide array of powers. Now, a lot of times they don't use all the power that they have. But did you know that when, when federal officials want to come into a county to uh, arrest somebody on federal charges, they have to get permission from the sheriff, first of all? And you know that the sheriff can deny them that position and can, if he, if he uh, denies them permission, can even arrest them um, for, you know, under the right circumstances. Uh, people, people don't realize that. Now, there's a, few, there's a few people that are out talking about that. Uh, sheriff Richard Mack is one that talks about, you know, and he, and he was a sheriff, and he knows what the power of a sheriff is, and, and he's out telling people that. Most sheriffs don't even know what their power is. Every once in a while, you'll see, you'll see a little bit of something. I remember hearing a, a news story, I think it was two years ago now, where the Cook County, Illinois sheriff decided that they were going to stop serving foreclosure notices. What they saw was a lot, of the, a lot of the properties that were being foreclosed on, it wasn't the owner that lived in the property, the, the, it was rental property, and the owner was being foreclosed on, and the renter had done nothing wrong, and they get put out in the street. Okay, and he, he just said, we're going to stop serving these foreclosure notices. Now, without serving the foreclosure notice, that means the foreclosure can't go forward. See the power that that sheriff had? Now, now, you know, again, you can debate whether he was right in doing that or wrong in doing it. My point is, he had the power to do it. And, and if you can get a local sheriff in place that understands constitutional principles and understands the power he has as a sheriff, that local sheriff can do a lot to protect the liberties of the people under his jurisdiction in that state. Um, we need to encourage legislators to have, we talked about as an individuals living as free people, encourage legislators on the state level, for instance, to interpose themselves and to, that's what some of these state sovereignty resolutions are about or different, you hear the term state nullification, okay? That's, that's a power that states have to protect the people within their state. And, and that's the kind of thing to encourage. You know, politicians by, by nature are not very courageous. You don't win elections often by being courageous because you make as many people mad as what you make happy. And a lot of times you make more people mad than what you make happy. But you got to let them know that you expect them to do what's right, even if it might cost them, even if it's going to get them some bad press or, or whatever. And, uh, and that needs to become what's expected of them. The, the, a big part of the job of the state government ought to be protecting the people in their state from the things the federal government wants to do to them. Um, and, and so, you know, the state and local level, that's, that's the place to get involved. Uh, understand that when it comes to voting, for instance, your vote on the local level is worth much more than your vote on the national level. On the national level, you're one vote out of millions. Um, out of out of really hundreds of millions um, on your state level you're one vote out of five million here in, in Wisconsin and not many that many votes right uh, you know you're you're one of a few million on your local level your county think about what what the power of your vote is there and not only that but local elections is where they have the lowest voter turnout so not only are you a bigger percentage of the possible voters, you're a huge percentage of the actual numbers of voters that are going to show up on election day. And that gives you a great deal of power on the local level. And again, if, if, you know, what, what, a lot of, what a lot of movements try and do, and, and some of these you know, constitutional movements and things, they focus on the national level. Well, if you can't even get something done on the local level, don't even, don't even start trying to do something on the national level, right? Think local. 
And there's a lot more benefit in it than what, what people realize. And, and there's a lot of things that, that can be done locally. Again, I mentioned the, the local sheriff. You know that, that the sheriff has power to do things like establish a local militia, these kinds of things. By the way, do you know that, that uh, some states right now are, are seriously considering reestablishing state militias? Okay? These are positive things that are happening. And, um, and, and they're good things from a constitutional perspective. Now, just with, with a few more minutes, let me say a few things about when it comes to political strategy, voting strategy, that kind of thing. There's, there's a lot of people that try and lead you around when it comes to, to voting strategy. And, you know, in, in the media you can follow, there's, there's the left-leaning media and there's the right-leaning media. And again, when it comes to constitutional issues, a lot of times neither one of them are right. You've got to get out of this, this idea of left or right, or uh, you know, viewing a, people view their political parties like they view a sports team, right? I mean, when, when the Green Bay Packers win or lose, that really doesn't affect me in, in one way or other, right? But, but I, get identify, I can identify myself with the Green Bay Packers so that I feel that when they win, I win, right? Well, Never do that with a political party because it's not like a sports team. Again, if the Green Bay Packers lose, it do, I don't lose anything. But when it comes to, to these issues of government and you lose, you stand to lose a lot. All right? And don't identify with a party where you feel like that party has to win for you to win because that party may not always be right. That party may be advocating something that's actually going to hurt you and hurt your liberty. And so you got to get out of this left-right paradigm and, and view things when it comes to national issues, view them based on what the Constitution says. Not what Rush Limbaugh says or not what Chris Matthews says, not, you know, but what does the Constitution say? And make informed votes. Most people go into the voting booth and again, because they identify with this party or that party, they just vote party ticket. Worst way to vote. You don't, you don't know who those people are if you haven't gone and, and you know, figured out what they're for. Uh, you don't know what their positions are. Just because somebody has an R after their name or a D after their name doesn't really mean anything. Uh, you know that often, often, um, in order to, to win an election or because they don't have anybody else interested in running, the political parties will convince somebody from the other party to switch their affiliation to run for a position so that their party can win that position. Now, when somebody does that, their, their positions on issues doesn't, don't change at all. All it changes is the letter behind their name and, and where they're listed on the ballot. Right? And so if you don't look into people, you don't know that. You want to know what their positions are. You want to know, are they going to obey their oath of office to preserve and defend the Constitution of the United States. They're all going to take that oath. Do they intend to keep that oath? Or do they intend to take the oath, never having read the Constitution, not caring what it says, and they're just going to do whatever their party leadership tells them? You see? And, and those are the kinds of issues you've got to hold them accountable to. Communicate with legislators. Write letters, emails, phone calls. In general, the more effort it takes to communicate with them through a certain medium, the more attention they pay to it. They don't pay a lot of attention to emails because an email is so easy to send. You don't, a lot of times with uh, some of the political websites, you don't even have to write the email. They write the whole email for you. You just click a button, they send the email and put your name on it. That doesn't mean very much. It's too, too easy to do. Um, writing out a letter by hand gets a little more notice. Now, you know, they do pay attention to the emails. Uh, general, generally, with a lot of these issues, what they do is their staffers will keep a tally of how many, how many comments they get on a certain thing, you know. But you pick up, you pick up the phone and call their office, that, that takes more effort and it gets more notice. You know, the many state legislators, you can call their office and they will answer the phone themselves. Um, I've had, I, I, think, I think, I've probably only called Marlon Schneiders, who's my state assemblyman, uh, I think I've maybe called his office twice, and both times he's answered the phone. Um, and, and so you can not just talk to a staffer, you can talk to them directly, often on the state level. National level, you're not going to 
you're not going to talk to them. You're going to talk to a staffer. But give that, that communication. Now, you know, you got to put it in perspective. And the reason people don't do it is they say, well, my, my communication is going to be one of thousands, and it doesn't really mean very much. And if I don't do it, there isn't much that's lost. But understand, there's a lot less people that contact legislators than what you think. And on a lot of issues, if you contact them about that issue, you might be one of only two or three people that contact them. And, and so they pay more attention than what you think they do. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to do what you want them to do, but they, they take that information into account. And, um, so, and, and again, you know, take advantage of some of the training that's out there that's available for dealing with politicians. Uh, we had at our, our Campaign for Liberty convention Last month, we had Kirk Shelley, who goes around the country and tells people how to, how to lobby for legislation. And, and a lot of times, you got to do the things that sometimes it's things you don't want to do. You know, If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And, uh, and you got to be careful about, you know, a lot of times you can think you had a victory, but it really was no victory at all. Uh, Kirk Shelley says that you should always be complaining. You know, never tell, he, he said, if you don't have anything mean to say about a politician, don't say anything at all. Because if you tell them they did a good job, they're going to stop, they're going to stop doing it. They're going to assume they're done, right? So whatever they do, and that's what, that's what the other side does, right? The health care bill passes, and what's the left doing? They're complaining. It doesn't go far enough. It doesn't do enough. We got to realize, even when we get something that we want, you got to complain and say, no, it's not enough. It's not, you know, I can guarantee you they could do more. Right? And, and there's a lot of those things of strategy that it just takes some effort to go and, and learn how to do it. And um, so that's where I'd like to then close. And ultimately, let me just say in closing, as a practical matter, the Constitution provides no, no barrier to the federal government today. Uh, it, you know... It, a very, very small barrier. Every once in a while you hear about, you know, the Supreme Court will overturn some law or whatever. But most of what the federal government is doing is unconstitutional. And you see, it doesn't provide much of a barrier. And well, that, that's going to happen when you have dishonest people in those positions that don't even know what the contract says and don't intend to follow the contract. And what that means is it's up to us to hold them accountable to it. And and it, it, there's another thing also to keep in mind. You know, for, for us, it might be enough to, to look at the text of the Constitution and say, here's what it says. It's black and white. They should be doing this. They shouldn't be doing that. But, you know, for most people, that argument isn't enough. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to them if that's what the Constitution says in black and white. You have to make the case. You have to make the case that we're better off when we follow the Constitution. Not just that it's right to follow it, but that we're better off when we follow it. And uh, that, that, again, can take some effort, take some self-education to understand why those principles work, why limited government is a good thing, and to find the arguments that really are persuasive to, to persuade people. But uh, the, you know, we have more of an opportunity right now to see at least some return to constitutional principles than there's ever been in my lifetime. And, and possibly better than there ever will be in the future. We have to, we have to take advantage of what's going on right now and, and uh, use that to, to uh, hold government accountable to the contract that we've made with them. All right, are there any questions or comments or your suggestions for uh, strategies and activities that we should be involved in to promote the Constitution. Well, I'd like to thank you, at least for making this civil discourse. Um, so much of our political discourse is uh, combative. Mm -hmm. And this was informative. And, and you know what you find, again, when you get out of that, that left-right paradigm, that left-right mindset, and you just look at it, what does the Constitution say? That a lot of times can, can, can uh, avoid some of that conflict and, and things. It's interesting how when, when, you, when, when you want the Constitution to be followed, a lot of times 
the right will think you're on the left, and the left will think you're on the right. Okay, Chris, Chris and I uh, at our our district GOP caucus, we were called lefties. Right now, that's probably the first time in my life I've been called a lefty. But anyway, we, we were called lefties. Um, and and you know, I mean, there's there's certain issues when you say, for instance, that the drug war is unconstitutional, which it is. Constitution doesn't give the federal government any power to set drug policy, to uh, prohibit, you know, one thing I, I could have pointed out with prohibition is at least at that time, they still felt it was necessary to pass a constitutional amendment to ban a substance. Today, we don't, we've got all kinds of substances that are banned. We don't pass any amendment to do it. At least at that time, I, you know, I don't think they should have passed it in the first place, but at least they felt it was necessary to pass an amendment. Now, you know, you take an issue like, like that, and when you take the constitutional position and say, states should make those laws, not the federal government, people say you're on the left. When you defend the Second Amendment, people say you're on the right. And, and so the, that, that's why you see, like in Ron Paul's presidential campaign, such a diverse group of people coming together because it was about the Constitution. Um, my, my wife made the comment at one rally that we were at. She said, this is the only place where you would see a, a Baptist homeschool family standing next to a couple of college students with dyed hair and piercings, you know? Where else are you going to see that? But, and, and Ron Paul said it over and over again, that liberty brings people together. You know, and, it, and it's a true thing. It's a true statement. I want to thank you too for taking the time. You've given me some different perspectives on things in, in the class. Um, from my perspective, what, what I think was important for me to come into an understanding where I am is to understand money and the role that it takes in our life and the transgressions that the government takes in, in uh, counterfeiting it, for one of a better word. Mm -hmm. And the more I study uh, money and, and economics, the more I can see how the government in interferes in all aspects of our life, not, not just money. But money is so foundational to everybody, mm -hmm. and they don't even know that that's going on. Um, yeah. In town here, we have a program called Life, Learning is Forever, or for everyone, not forever. And it's through the university, there's like 300 people that are signed up for it and there's a bunch of different lectures that are given by retired professors and, and teachers and just regular people. And one of the sessions I'm in is on economics and Kathy is in there as well and we met in there actually. Um, it, it's amazing because in the class of maybe 15 people, maybe 12 of them at least are all on the left side in wanting more government, more taxes, more control. And they don't even understand what money is. And the professor doesn't either. Mm -hmm. Because I talked to him about Austrian economics and sound money and you know, he has no clue. He doesn't know who, uh, you know, some of the big names like uh, Bob Mises and he doesn't even know that person. Probably knows Hayek. He knows Hayek. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He'll refer to Hayek and he did bring in the video, the Hayek rap video with uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so that got his attention but uh, he doesn't need to, it, I don't know but when you bring this up uh, where from the money perspective then it can be expanded into these other ones because people want to understand the value of money but not really what it is mm -hmm. so for me uh, that's a that's what I do is try to understand it from that perspective and carry it over to you. yep yep you know that 16th amendment in the same year that they, they ratified the amendment that allowed the, the government to tax your income, they also set up a system that allowed the government to essentially take money out of your pocket without, without you ever having to pay them anything, right? Federal Reserve System, which allows the government to control the rate of inflation, which is a, a hidden tax. And uh, so they can, they can take your money through the income tax, but they can take your money where you have the same number of dollars in your wallet, but they've benefited and your dollars buy less. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us for this series of classes on the United States Constitution. And I hope it's been informative for
for you and much more than just a history lesson. I, I hope that looking at the Constitution in this way helps you to have a, a, just a good grasp of what your liberties and rights are and the responsibility that your government has to protect those rights. We see them often being the, the violator of our rights, but uh, hopefully you see some of, the, some of the solutions to restoring constitutional government. There's no one that is going to be more motivated to defend your liberty than you are. And so it's an important thing for each of us to be vigorously defending the rights that we have and holding our government accountable to the contract of the Constitution.